Good evening. Welcome to Voice in the Wilderness Ministries. This is the second week we're uh, taping for our broadcast at Sunnyside Mission Center here in Sunnyside, Houston, here in the middle of Houston. And once again, we want to thank them for having us over to bring the word. They have been very gracious and they've been very kind, very nice people. It is dedicated to the discipleship of the youth and of the Christian faith through arts and music and allowing those with those special talents to no longer be ignored or slighted in God's call and God's work. And hopefully, if we can do it, maybe we can get a preacher or two out of it as well. In the meantime, we'll let God take care of that. We are thankful tonight that Sunnyside Mission Center here in Houston, Texas is having us, and we pray this service blesses you. In Jesus' name. Good evening. Welcome to Voice in the Wilderness Ministries. We are so thankful to once again be ministering here at Sunnyside Mission Center. We thank them once again, and we want to thank all of our national and international uh, folks who are, have aligned with us and partnered with us and joined with us in God's call to reach the entire world for Jesus Christ. Tonight, we want to talk to you about the importance of guarding your heart. Well, the message I want to call, Beware. Not everything that is Christian is Christian. And how do, you, how do you separate the actual from the artificial, from the consecrated, from the counterfeit, from the wheat and the tares? Tares and wheat look just alike, but one's going to the right hand and one's going to the left hand when this is all over. And this has a lot to do with what we put in our spirit. The scripture tonight that we're going to start off with is Matthew 16, verses 13 through 19. It talks about the establishment of the church and how we are to charge the gates of hell and they shall not be able to prevail against us. The irony, the permeating irony, is it appears that the world and the evil in this world has penetrated the house of God and holiness, without which no man will see the Lord, has become a lost doctrine and a lost statement in the tsunami of personal reflection and opinion. This is not a syncretic faith. This is not a one-size-fits-all faith. All people are welcome, but the truth is what they must obey. Matthew 16, verses 13 through 19, the Bible says, As Jesus was entering the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And some said, John the Baptist, or Elijah, or one of the prophets. But he, then he said, But who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And he said, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed this unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. And upon this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven, that whatsoever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. God has called us to charge the gates of hell to be the head, and not the tail. He has called us to know the truth and that the truth will set us free. Christianity always affirms the true deity and the true humanity of our Savior, Jesus Christ. He is both fully God and fully man, the true union of the two natures. Denial of Christ's atoning work on the cross is another heresy accepted by those that are false. They discount the blood shed by Jesus on the cross and become bloodless religions. Speaking of Jesus as a good man or a prophet of God, but denying him as the Son of God. They also deny his virgin birth, his bodily resurrection, and discount his second return to the earth. The Holy, of Trinity, the Holy Trinity is rejected in many of the occults. The question is, what do you think of Jesus? Is answered correctly only by the believing Christian. The Christian gladly answers, Jesus Christ is the only begotten Son of God, Son of the living God, God incarnate in the form of human flesh born of a virgin. He is the Son of Man, the only Savior of the world, the author and the finisher of our faith, who through His death on the cross provides redemption for all who believe in Him. He is the one who died for our sins, rose on the third day, lives to make intercession for us before the Father, and who will one day come in His glorious body, returning to judge the quick and the dead and His appearing in His kingdom. He is Lord and God, and in Him alone we have life, and have life more abundantly. Jesus is the, Son represented, is the Son represented in the Godhead, the only true God and one God eternally existing in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Excuse me. Each person of the Godhead is eternal and 
co-equal with the others. The Bible is the recorded word of God and is infallible. It is the final authority in regard to all Christian doctrine. Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, is the central figure of the Bible, and we live our life solely for Him. That's what it means to be a Christian. But you've got to search long and wide and hard and intensely to find anybody that says that in the Christian church right now, other than a few. You scroll through whatever you can find on the media, social media, or any of the resources that are provided for the proclamation of the gospel, and you're not going to hear this because a lot of people don't like it, and people don't want to hear it. That's just too bad. It is still your obligation to tell them whether they want to hear it or not. And that's not being mean-spirited, and that's be because we have allowed a generation who does not know this, to assume leadership positions based on raw talent and raw ability and raw charisma. And they are leading a generation of people to damnable hell. If you, are not, if you do not subscribe to this, there's trouble coming. This is what it means to be a Christian. God loves you and sent his son to die for your sins. And any other message outside of this is wrong. In fact, Christ himself told us this would be the sign of the last times. In Matthew 24, verses 4 and 5, the Bible says, And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. In verse 11, it says, False Christ and false prophets shall arise and deceive many. Verse 24, the number one sign of his return is false prophets would sprout up like weeds in the lawn that hasn't been fertilized. And you have to fertilize yourself with the word of God so that you can keep yourself from these spiritual opportunists, opportunists that think they're doing God's work and don't have a clue what it means to be saved. But they operate in the prophetic. If you're operating in the prophetic and you know the holiness of God, you know you can never get it wrong. You cannot be wrong or be wrong deliberately and expect to escape the wrath of God. And people, there's no greater demonstration of this than in the Church of the United States of America. Some of the things that were said last year to and fro are the most embarrassing testimony of the Christian faith I've ever seen. Egomaniacs running amok, speaking in the name of God and saying things that had nothing to do with the outcome of anything that happened and won't apologize for it, but some of them actually blame God for getting it wrong. Beware. This is not an indictment against anybody. If it's applicable, so be it. If it's not, and that doesn't apply to you, don't worry about it. I'm not speaking to you. But there is a culture of spiritual indifference to the holy things of God that has culminated with a lot of people being wrong about a lot of things and embarrassing themselves in a nation that now makes examples of them on YouTube through their sarcastic and bombastic and misplaced charismatic utterings. So please, please be careful with what you're doing. Be careful with what you say. If it doesn't glorify Christ, if it doesn't edify the Holy Spirit, if it does not bring glory to the Father, if it does not help people find the cross, and if they're, they've come to the cross disciple and, and, and guard their hearts against the evils of this world, it's really not worth listening to, and it's really not worth reading as far as that goes. You've got to understand, there is a very real devil on this earth, and his sole objective is to see that you discount, discard, or disremove anything of God in your life. So be careful. Be truly careful with your life. Be careful with your heart. Be careful who your friends are. Be careful who you trust in ministry. Be careful who you put your faith in. Be careful who you would give your life to in ministry and in cooperation. Many people who go to church have no regard for sin and its consequences in other people's lives. And they're filled with them. And God's tired of it, especially in America. Please, hear these words well. Nobody wants anybody to die and go to hell. Nobody wants to discount the love of God. Nobody's placing blame on anybody. It is a general culture that has disregarded this, and because of this, a multitude of people lost their lives because a pandemic showed up on the scene. Now, you may not think God's part of that pandemic, but nothing escapes the willful, permission, permissive will of God. Our sin 
has caused this to happen. And only repentance and redemption from sin is going to make it go away, if it can go away at all at this point. But without repentance and remission of sins, this is not going to work. You can write all the books you want. You can grandiose on all the Hollywood movie stars you want. You can write all of this. You can have the biggest church in the world. You can do all of that. You can say, look at me. I must be doing something right. You couldn't be further from the truth. The remnant church will be the one that is the most faithful to him. It will be the most obedient to him. And he's looking for people that are going to, to say this. Acts 20, <clears throat> verses 28 through 29, or 30. And take heed unto yourselves, and to the flock over which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers. To every pastor, this needs to be. To anyone who pastors a church or a ministry, this needs to be. Words that are embedded and engraved in the heart of your ministry. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to the flock with which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God with which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves of your own, shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. And also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. You see, it's no strange thing when demons dress themselves up as ministers. 2 Corinthians 11, verses 12 through 15, But what I do, that will I do, that I may cut off occasion from them which desire occasion, that wherein they may be found, even as we. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed as an angel of light. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their work. Be very careful. Not everything that glitters is gold. In Galatians 1, 6-9, the Bible says, I marvel that you are so far removed from he who called you into the grace of God into another gospel, which is not another gospel, but there are some that would trouble you and pervert the gospel. For though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we preach, let him be accursed. As I've said before, so now I say again, if any man preach any other gospel than that which you have received from us, let him be accursed. For do we seek to persuade men or God or do I seek to please men? For if I seek to please men, then I should not be the servant of Christ. It's time to get the people pleasers out of the pulpits and put the preachers back in the pulpits who love people but love God more so that the people can see the love of God in their pastors and their ministers' heart. It's time to stop the humanism, the false spiritualism, the false propaganda, and show and demonstrate the love of God through the Word of God in Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior by the Spirit that anointed you for the privilege to do it in the first place. Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, which means there's nothing else to add concerning the affairs of the souls of men. 2 Thessalonians 2, 3-4, through 4, the Bible says, Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come except there be a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalted himself above all that is called God or is at worship, so that, ha that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself to be God. 1 Timothy 4.1, the Bible says, The Spirit expressly states that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith and give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. 2 Peter 2, 1-3, through 3, the Bible says, But there were also false prophets among them, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that brought them, and shall bring unto themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by whom the way of truth is evil spoken of, and through covetousness they shall with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment for a long time lingers not, whose damnation now slumbers not. 1 John 4, 1 through 6, the Bible says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every, you want to know what the Spirit of God? Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. The Messiah, the Savior of mankind has come in the flesh 
is of God. And every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God and is of that spirit of Antichrist where we said he would come and even now already is in the world. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Let me start off with this. Beware of false prophets. Don't let someone prophesy over you that's not speaking the word of God. If your spirit detects that they don't glorify Jesus Christ, walk away from them. I don't care if they're national TV preachers. I don't care if they're local, t local preachers. I don't care where they are. If your spirit says they are not glorifying Christ, ignore it. Cast it out of your spirit. Don't allow a false prophet to imprison you spiritually through a perception of yourself that God never told you he was going to do. A prophet should be confirming what's already in your heart that God has spoken unto you through his word. They are never opposite of each other. And last year you saw more things said about God than you will ever see by more places and more people and more parts of the world at all times than there ever was before. There is a grave danger to what happened last year when all of this started and all of these people who claimed to know what God was saying didn't and wound up, now we wound up in a mess. 500,000 lives at least to COVID, if, and that's just here that are attributed to that. Now I know the politics of all this, but there's enough to concern ourselves with the fact that it is a deadly disease and it was brought on and when it was spoken of in the name of the Lord was not cured or healed until just about right now, if, that, if it's to be told. Nobody said it would happen now. They said it would happen before. Be careful with this. Look, I had a guy that wanted to win the election. I wanted to win the election too. He stood for the things that most Christians do. But God didn't want him in there. Now that may change in 2024. It may not. I don't know. But our job is to preach the gospel. Our job is to make disciples. Our job is to take care of the church of God first. And then we vote on our conscience and on the Bible in the voting booth. And when we allow one to overcome the other, we have become part of the world and not part of the solution. And I know you speak out against injustices. Lord knows there are very few people that have spoke out against abortion more than I have, long before it became politically profitable to do so. In Deuteronomy 13, 1 through 5, God speaks of why he allows warlocks, witches, false prophets, necromancers, those that speak to the dead, and anything of the occult. When he says in Deuteronomy 13, verses 1 through 5, if there shall arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and they give you a sign or wonder, and the sign or wonder comes to pass, that they say unto you, let us go after other gods that you know not and serve them. God makes it very clear. You shall not hearken unto the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God proves you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. And a great number of people in this church have their hands in the, in the occultic and have their hands in the church. And I can tell you there is no greater treason than obligating yourself or giving yourself any due diligence to anything that is of the occultic nature. You might think it's just television. You might just think it's characters and acting. But there are very real spirits that use that to sabotage your walk with God. How ridiculous, who, someone who takes the name of God, or even more ridiculous, who's been baptized in the Holy Spirit, was given the capacity to use discernment against all evil to fall prey to something of the occultic and then justify it through a worldly means. You have to understand what happens here. Verse 5 says, And that prophet or that dreamer of dream shall be put to death because he has spoken to turn you away from the Lord your God. Do you understand that? That if it was biblically accurate and the patience and the forbearance of God wasn't in front, that most of these people would have been killed for multiple deceptions based on God's holiness. But he's giving people time to repent and he's giving them room to repent. And if you spoke a false prophecy into somebody's life recently, you had better repent because he has remembered it and he will not forget it. And your talent and your charisma and your money and your influence isn't going to make any difference in the day of judgment when he examines your heart and decides whether you go to heaven or hell or not. So be careful. You cannot have your foot in one world and in the one in the church. Jeremiah 5, 31. The prophets falsify, the prophets false, prophesy falsely and the priests bear rule by their means and my people 
Love to have it so. And what will you do in the end thereof? What's going to happen here? It's not going to end well for a lot of us if we don't warn the people, if we don't tell them. Jeremiah 23, verse 32, the Bible says, Behold, I am against them that prophesy false dreams, saith the Lord, and do tell them, and cause my people to err by their lies and their lightness. Yet I have sent them not, nor commanded them, therefore they shall not profit this people at all, saith the Lord. Jeremiah 29, 8 and 9, For thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Let not your prophets or your, your dinners be in the midst of you, deceive you, neither hearken to your, dream, to, to your dreams which cause you to be dreamed. For they prophesy falsely unto you in my name. I have not sent them, saith the Lord. Much of the Christian faith, when Christ talks about not getting in through the straight gate or the, going through the straight gate or the wide gate, has much to do with your relationship with false prophets, which come to you in wolf's clothing, or sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. Jesus said, the dividing line between those that enter and don't are their relationship to their fruit. In Matthew 7, verse 15, the Bible says, Beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. You shall know them by their fruit. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree brings forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth forth not good fruit is hewn down and cast in the fire, for by your fruits you shall know them. Matthew 24, verses 11 and 24. And many false prophets shall arise and shall deceive many. And there shall arise false Christs and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders and so much that if it were possible, they would deceive the very elect. Mark 13, verse 22. For false Christs and false prophets shall arise and show signs and wonders to seduce, if it were possible, even my own people. 2 Timothy 3, 13. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Number two. Beware of false teachers or pastors. Just because somebody's got a pulpit doesn't mean they're telling you the truth. I have seen some of the most ridiculous displays of the preaching of the Word of God I have ever seen in my life. I have seen preaching that does the only time they talk about Jesus is in Jesus' name at the end of the service as half the crowd has bolted out the doors for lunch in the house of God. This is a holy institution. And it's supposed to be led and stewarded by holy people. This is not, I'm not going to harp on this. I'm just telling you, beware of false teachers. And if somebody you go to church with can't explain, who's leading you in a Sunday school class or as a pastor and cannot fully explain what it means to be redeemed from your sin and the saviorship of the Lord Jesus Christ, then you're in the wrong church. And if they know it and don't tell you, you're still in the wrong church. One of the reasons I became a pastor to go talk was most of my early, most of Vicki and I's early years in the church, we asked questions and said, you don't need to know that. You don't need to know that. You know, it's not, it's not for you to know. I hate, I hate people that try to be transparent and are hiding something. I, I do. I said, it's a fault I have to work on. Playing to the camera and to the popularity contest but as the Christian faith is going to bring the judgment, not one brick upon another is going to be left upon that church unless it repents. As he has wiped out every illegitimate ministry and every illegitimate religion before us, this country is not exempt from his judgment, and we should have figured that out by now. Beware of false teachers or false pastors. 2 Corinthians, again, I repeat it again, 11, 13 through 15. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed as an angel of light. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. Listen to how you describe a false teacher. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who hold the truth and unrighteousness, because that which may be known of God is manifest to them, for God hath shown it to them. In Romans 16, verses 17 and 18, I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause offenses and divisions contrary to the doctrine which you have learned, and avoid them, for they that are such serve not the Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and through fair speeches and good works deceive the hearts of the simple." Galatians 1, 6-9, I marvel that you are so far removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. But though we or any other man teach any other gospel, 
But though we are an angel from heaven, teach any other gospel unto you than that which you have heard received from us, let him be accursed. As I have said before, so now I say again, if any man preaches any other gospel than that which we preach to you, let him be accursed. The gospel of Jesus Christ is our message. Now, obviously in church services, discipleship, edification, comfort, dealing with life's problems, that's the venue for that. But you come to the church because you have the answer to those life's problems in Jesus Christ and the Word of God, and they're to be distributed under that foreknowledge by the Holy Spirit and the Word which, which you're taught to teach these people. I love the Word of God. I love the Word of God because it's kept me alive for a long time. And it saddens me that we actually have a Christian bestseller list and there's not a Bible in the bunch. And yet the Bible is distributed more than any place else in the world. You know, if we told these folks the truth a little bit more than we do, and we told them about hell, maybe there wouldn't be so much of it in the streets. Do you know the city of Houston last year had 500 murders in it? Do you know that cities like Chicago and New Orleans and Baltimore... Cleveland, but now it's pretty much predominant. Most major cities have more fatalities, murders, shootings, stabbings, and yet they have the strictest gun laws in their cities. And they're run by politicians that say they represent them and do anything but. The conditions, as I was a kid in a major city, are no different when I went to bury my father than they are right now. All of the promises of the politicians you all place your hope in so deeply and so passionately have let us down. And it's nothing compared to what's coming because we're going to pay the price for our disobedience and our disloyalty to God, and it's coming soon. And I'm not a morbid person one bit, but if you think that we're going to keep doing the same things that we've been doing the last 50 years and getting away with it, that's the definition of insanity. So I've come tonight to warn you. I've come tonight to tell you. I've come tonight on a mission from the Lord. And I ask you in the name of Jesus to consider all this nonsense and stop it, and especially in full gospel ministries. What are some of you people thinking? I am serious. Why are you doing this to these people? And you know who you are. I have full gospel ministries I love. But it used to stand for something. Pentecost, there's a vast difference between Orthodox Pentecostalism and contemporary 21st century Neo-Pentecostalism. It's become one big bake sale. It's about the money. It's about the power. It's about the influence. And I'm, I know that you give to ministries and you, you help people. I get that. But the culmination that broke my heart was the one day the Lord had me watch six Christians get martyred on the same day a televangelist asked for a plane. There's nothing wrong with him asking for a plane on his own site, but it just seemed ridiculous at the hour. Do you know that 400 of your brothers and sisters are martyred in foreign countries every day? If we cry because 500 people get murdered a year in Houston. 400 Christians every day trying to win the lost. Some of the people that come to me at Voice in the Wilderness Ministries from these foreign countries live in the kind of blight and poverty that none of us could truly understand. And they cry day and night for God. And they cry day and night. And they, ad they admire a country that stands on biblical principles but preaches and acts like so few of them really, really mean anything to them. It's more than just picking a religious fight. I believe that if there's a remnant people that I'm talking to right now that know they have betrayed and they have gone off the side of the road on their ministry and on their message. And I'm appealing to you right now to turn your hearts back to God. And if you want to hate me, hate me. That's okay. 
If you think I'm wrong, that's okay. God will be the judge of it. But I can assure you I have been sent by him to warn this country and these people that their sin has not gone unnoticed and this judgment is just the beginning of what's coming if we do not repent and turn our hearts back to God. This is not a game. This is not a place of influence. This is the eternal souls of men that hang in the balance between what you believe and what you think. So I'm not here to make war with you. The scripture says, let him, that be, let him that be unjust be unjust still. Let him that be filthy, let him be filthy still. Let him be righteous, be righteous still. And let him be holy. He's coming and his reward is with him. And every one of us are going to be judged. Every single one of us who calls ourselves a prophet or an apostle or a priest or a pastor or a teacher or a leader as the contemporary form of it is. I'll tell you something, there's no such thing as a leader without a ministry in, in religion or the Christian faith. You're all ministers of the gospel. Leader is a human endeavor. Why do we have to incorporate the world in so much of what we do? Yeah, we got to be relevant. Yeah, we got to reach them where they are. But why can't you get in front of a camera and say this before the world? Why can't you tell people that need to know the truth? Why can't you accept everybody that wants to talk to you about Christ? And, and by, Why can't you just at least give them a minute of your time? Why can't you give the ones that are coming behind you that look to you for an example of the truth and lead them to Christ as a minister of the gospel? And don't be concerned with what title you get or who gets the glory. Do the right thing for the right reason, and I promise you God will bless you, and God will keep you. Yes, God wants to bless you. Yes, God wants to give you his favor. But that has become the central theme. He, if he doesn't do anything else for us, he's done more than we'll ever be able to thank him for. You know, when I was told I'd have to do these kind of things, I didn't really want to do it. And I still don't really want to do it, because I know how these things respond. But there's a burden that he put in my heart to stand in front of all of you and do this at the expense of time with my wife and kids, the expense of my job, because there's a lost world and somebody's got to tell them to come home. And while I'm the least qualified, the least of the orators and narratives, I've got a few people that believe in me. And based on that trust, I owe them to tell this world the truth. If it wasn't for God, it would be for them. But it is for God. I've got people in this room that have placed their trust in me as a voice in the wilderness. We established this ministry so that we could stand out from, from outside of the nonsense and outside of the political games and simply know that there are people that need to hear the simple truth that are still on this earth and we pray as long as we are here, to the best of our ability, we will give you that word, we will proclaim that word, as God has given us that word, and we thank you for all of you who believe in us, who care about us, who pray for us, and who love us. It's a dirty job. You don't make many friends. And certainly, in social circles, you're an outcast. But in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, it's a job that's got to be done, and people have to do it. He didn't call just me to do it. He called all of us at some point or another to stand up in the face of the world and tell the truth. We don't have anything against people that sin. They're just, they, most of them don't even know the difference anymore. You can impact somebody's life in a great way, whether it's preaching, the expression of music or the arts that these wonderful people here do, by setting yourself up and defining yourself as the truth is in you, no matter who likes it or dislikes it, and do it in love. You do it, in, you do it all in love, but you do it knowing that not everybody's going to see it as the voice of love. For these children that are coming behind us and their kids that are coming behind us, if Jesus tarries, what are we leaving them? Are we leaving a country that has lost its glory and its passion for the truth, that stood as a light to the world? I submit to you today that if this was my last service, I've done everything I know how to do to tell as many people as I know how without being overbearing and being led by the Spirit to come to Jesus Christ. I am a 
I'm an evangelist watchman. I know people call me pastor because that's what they're used to seeing me as being. But I'm a watchman for the Lord my God. And I'm calling all men who want to know the truth, all men and women, all children who desire the truth, that the Spirit of God will compel them to come to the altar of the base of the Lord Jesus Christ and stop the political and religious bickering and surrender yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Because time is short. And while I would never ever proclaim to know the time of his coming, there is certainly enough evidence of it that it could. And it presents a compelling argument. But more importantly, there is no question that his hand of judgment is upon this nation. And a lot of people, since this pandemic has let up, have gone back to business as usual. Business will never be as usual again. The government's already coming after us. Soon we will no longer be able to give you these services. Because if we speak of salvation and sin and hell, we will be taken off the air. But as long as we have the privilege, as long as the Holy Ghost provides the way, we will stand up to the sin of this world and the God of this world and we will speak for the eternal God and His glorious Son, Jesus Christ. If that is your heart, we're asking you to join us at Voice in the Wilderness Ministries. But more importantly, if you have, group, if you have people under you, whether you're a ministry or a church, we compel you to go back into them and feed them the Word of God and to give them the hope that is in them. There are a lot of people that are not coming back to church. There are a lot of people that need to come back to church. Because Christ is not taking anybody but, some, but his church back with him. So the island mentality has to go as well. I compel you tonight as a priest of God, not a perfect one, not an articulate one, not an influential one, but one with a passion for the lost and one with a passion to preach the gospel, please consider your ways. And if you hear a voice standing behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it, turn your hearts back to God. Tonight, we have presented two very important messages back to back for those that are at ease in Zion. The coming of the Lord is assured at some point. Do not be as Noah was. No, the people of Noah's day were taking it for granted. The Bible says, but as in the days of Noah, so shall the days of the coming of the Son of Man be. For in the days that were before the flood, men were eating and drinking and marrying and remarrying and given in marriage right up until the day that Noah entered the ark and knew not until the flood came and consumed them all. So also shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Do not become a casualty of your own ignorance and your own smugness. It is with humility and gratitude we come before the throne of God and we pray you will too. If I have spoken to your heart this day, I'm asking you to lay down at the altar of the base of the cross and get saved. Let your, hearts, let, not your, let your hearts be rendered, not your garments. Tonight is a holy moment. Tonight is a moment of consecration. Do not fall casualty to this world. Give your hearts to God. Give your souls to God. Give your hopes to God. And you will find a happiness and a peace. And never mind... Never mind the political nonsense and the business nonsense and the spiritual nonsense of this world tripping over each other to climb to the highest prominent place. But be men of low esteem and love the Lord your God with all your heart and do not worry. God's got everything under control. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we are compelled to bring this world into your presence. May the words that we have spoken May you bless it with a 30, 60, 100-fold harvest of souls. May your blessing rest on each heart that is submitting themselves to you right now, that is pondering their fate and their spiritual walk at this moment. May this moment of consecration, may this moment of love and compassion that is being poured out to every single human being within the sound of my voice bring that result that you desire to be restored into the fellowship of the household of saints, that we, as ambassadors for Christ, have brought a message of reconciliation. Yes, we warned. Yes, we chided. 
But yes, we also offered hope, and that hope is in Jesus Christ. I pray that no matter what else happens in my life, that when I had the opportunity to honor you and do what you wanted me to do, that to the best of my ability, I tried to obey you and I tried to give that word, even at my own personal risk. So I'm asking you to honor these words. May every soul within the sound of my voice, may you drop lovingly into their hearts and examine them and purge them from anything that would separate you from them and let them completely and absolutely divest themselves of anything in this world and throw themselves in loving compassion and kindness and love into your presence through Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. God bless you all.